And so I think an air or an attitude of expectancy uh, is important uh, to setting the stage for recognizing serendipitous gifts when they occur. Dr. Lefkowitz, man, welcome to the show. What a pleasure. My pleasure indeed to be with you today, Joseph. And by the way, please call me Bob, not Robert. I, I always explain to people that uh, I have very negative associations with Robert. I think the reason is when I was a little kid growing up, I was kind of mischievous. My mother always called me Bobby, uh, except if I was misbehaving. Uh, and then she would say something like, Robert, get in here. Uh, and I knew I was in trouble. So uh, uh, I much prefer Bob to Robert. Got it. Well, I, I don't want you thinking you're in trouble today, so we, we'll keep it to Bob. Um, man, I would love to ask you, because you know, just to kind of quantify your work, in terms of the clinical applications of what you found, how many people have would you say have been impacted um, by your work, I guess, from a kind of a clinical uh, perspective? Is it, is it quantifiable? Not really, but it's a pretty large number. Uh, just to give you an idea, here in the States, you know, uh, drugs are controlled by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. They have to uh, approve a drug through a lengthy process before it can be prescribed. Uh, and I think we probably, you know, kind of a, a world leader in that regard. Anyway, they say that about one third of all FDA approved medications uh, are drugs which target these G protein coupled receptors that we discovered in my lab uh, a number of years ago. Uh, just for some quantitation that amounts to about 700 drugs. Uh, I dare say uh, most of the people listening or watching this podcast have taken drugs that target this family of uh, receptors. There are about a thousand different G protein coupled receptors and they, they regulate virtually every known physiological process in humans, including, by the way, a number of our sensory modalities, such as vision, smell, and taste, uh, all are mediated by this type of receptor. But more to the point of your question, in terms of clinical drugs, uh, for example, uh, anything which targets the histamine receptor, antihistamines, who hasn't taken an antihistamine at some point? Uh, but yeah, those would have been developed based on uh, on our work. Beta blockers, uh, drugs for depression, diabetes, you know, something which is all the rage these days. I mean, uh, I assume it's true uh, over where you are as well as here are drugs for diabetes, uh, which, uh, which are now found to cause amazing weight loss, right? Uh, they're all the rage. I assume you've heard of this. Uh, but you know, so those would be just a few examples. So I would say tens of millions of people, uh, maybe more than that, and, and really not quantifiable because basically a substantial part of modern therapeutics is composed of drugs which target these receptors. Yeah, the, the drug for diabetes metformin. Um, I've heard people on this show talking that they, you know, that don't have diabetes saying that they're taking it for longevity purposes well right i'm not metformin is not a drug which targets these receptors but what you say is uh interesting these days uh the drugs uh, in the united states go by names like wegovi uh, mongiorno uh, but they probably have different names in your country one of the things that I, I i imagine we're going to talk a lot about today is this you know this idea of serendipity of of luck of chance of randomness and um, one of the things that i found just incredible was that you know at, at kind of the foundation of, of this you know uh, tremendous impact was that the vietnam war 
seem to play quite a substantial uh, part in all this. So how did that kind of, I guess, um, alter the trajectory of your life? That's a, that's a very uh, pertinent question and a very important one. So I graduated medical school in 1966. Uh, to that point in time, I had been remarkably focused on a single goal, to become a doctor and spend my life practicing medicine. I had conceived of that goal when I was just a young lad, uh, probably seven or eight years old. And I was uh, drawn in that direction by my family physician, a man named Dr. Joseph Feibusch, who I idolized. This guy made house calls uh, in the Bronx where I was growing up, come to the house uh, with that black bag out of which he would uh, take or produce all manner of magical instruments, a stethoscope, an otoscope, an ophthalmoscope, a, a tongue depressor. I mean, it was just amazing. He'd let me listen to my heart. And so I was convinced in an early age that my destiny, my calling, of course, I didn't know that concept, was to become a practicing doctor. And when I graduated from Columbia Medical School in 1966, that was still my only goal. But here's where the serendipity comes in. I mean, there, there was... Uh, a war raging, the Vietnam War, uh, and uh, the United States was deeply involved in that. There was a lottery draft for all men over 18. That meant everybody was issued a, uh, a number, and they literally would pull numbers out of a barrel, and depending on whether your number came up or not, you'd be drafted for two years and sent to Vietnam. But for physicians, those graduating medical school, there was no lottery. Everybody was drafted. It was called the doctor draft. And you went in for two years. Typically, you could arrange for a, upon medical school for a two-year further deferment to get some postgraduate clinical training as an intern and a resident. But then you went in for two years. And you went into either the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, or the United States Public Health Service. Uh, the first three services pretty much guaranteed you'd spend one of your two conscripted years in Vietnam. The war was very unpopular. Uh, there were demonstrations, even riots against it. Uh, very unpopular war. None of us wanted to support it. The only way to avoid active service in the war zone was to get into the public health service, uh, to get a commission in, in the public health service. And that, of course, became extraordinarily competitive. Fortunately for me, uh, I had high academic standing, had gone to good schools, been top of my class. I was drafted into the public health service, and that was good because you now stood a chance of being assigned stateside to one of their uh, research institutions like the Communicable Disease Center, CDC, the NIH, several others. I was assigned to the NIH uh, and assigned to work in a laboratory 80% of my time. 20% of my time was spent taking care of patients on the clinical service there at the NIH. Uh, and so there I was exposed serendipitously, and not because I particularly wanted to do it, to research for the first time. Also for the first time in my life, I met with a new experience, namely unmitigated protracted failure, uh, which I had never encountered in my life to that point. Uh, I had always been quite successful at everything I undertook. Uh, but here for a year, a year and a half, I struggled mightily. And so I decided that when I finished my two-year commitment to the NIH, I would go seek some other uh, fortune, particularly I'd go back to clinical training. And I made such arrangements. Uh, but meanwhile, as luck would have it, during the second year, I met with a modest amount of success, published my first scientific papers, realized research wasn't that bad, uh, that it could be fun when you were having success, but I was certainly not enamored enough to change my plans, despite the importuning of my mentors. And so uh, on July 1st of 1970, I traveled to Boston to continue my clinical training at the Massachusetts General Hospital, which is the main teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. I threw myself into the clinical work uh, for the first six months, but then I had an epiphany because I realized something was missing. Uh, I had always loved clinical work and I was good at it, but 
somehow I wasn't deriving quite the same level of satisfaction from it that I had before. And so I realized uh, eventually that what was missing was the lab, that I actually missed being in the laboratory, grappling with scientific problems, getting, you know, that wonderful feeling of making little discoveries day to day. And so I arranged to go back into the laboratory. I found another mentor. Uh, and for my remaining two and a half years in Boston, I split my time between finishing my clinical training and working in the laboratory. And then on July 1st, 1973, I received an excellent job offer from Duke. Uh, and I moved here to Duke 50 years ago. Uh, initially, thinking I would split my time, maybe pretty much equally between being a phys clinical professor of medicine and teaching medicine uh, to students and house staff, and then doing research. But very quickly, my research program took off. And even, even without actually planning it, uh, within a few years, I was spending 80, 85% of time in the laboratory, and only about 15% of my time doing clinical teaching. And so were it not for the Vietnam War, and being drafted and sent to the NIH, I never would have had a research career. The interesting thing about that is my experience was far from unique. Uh, all over the country, really bright physicians who might otherwise not have gone into research were drafted into the public health service and sent to the NIH. Uh, and just to give you some statistics on that, we were called, uh, there was a uh, kind of pejorative moniker uh, that got attached to us, meaning those physicians who were sent to the NIH and the public health service as part of the draft. We were referred to as yellow berets, okay? This is a, uh, a corruption of the term green berets. So green berets are our most elite uh, uh, combat force, special forces. Yellow, of course, implies cowardice. And so, uh, because we didn't go to Vietnam. And so people, you know, our colleagues referred to us as yellow berets. In fact, we referred to ourselves as yellow berets. It was a relatively small program, maybe 50 to 100 physicians a year were sent there to the NIH. But between 1964 and 1972, which were the peak years of the Vietnam War, eight years, there's not a lot of people in the program during that, 10 of us would go on to win the Nobel Prize. And so 10 of us, guys like me, for the most part, no prior research training. Uh, and 10 of us went on <laughs> to win the Nobel Prize. The crazy thing is that in my cohort, which means those of us who graduated medical school in 66, went to the NIH in 68 and left in 70. Four of us, four of the 10 came out of my class. So four, four of myself, I mean, we were all friends. We knew each other there. We rotated night call uh, at the clinical center. Four of us went on to win the Nobel Prize. Another guy in our class, whom you may have heard of, who did not win the Nobel Prize, was Tony Fauci, okay, who's a good friend of mine. In fact, at this big celebration we had last week, it was so sad that he couldn't make it. He had a prior commitment, but he sent a wonderful five-minute video message talking about our long friendship, dating back to our years together at the NIH, So, in which he kind of wonderfully, his wonderful sense of humor, he kind of use self-deprecating humor to say, you know, the, he says, you know, all these guys were my friends. He says, I'm the only one who didn't win the Nobel Prize. But he did okay. He did okay for himself. This idea of a randomness, chance, serendipity. And many years ago, um, uh, a good friend told me um, that, and this has stuck with me for a long time, that life is more like poker than chess because because in the game of chess whoever strategically makes the smartest moves wins the game whereas in a game of poker whoever you know you can have a bad ha bad hand and still win you can have a good hand and still lose you know you can be at the airport your flight gets delayed you meet your future spouse um you could be you could have a cardiac arrest on the day of a marathon in your city 
Um, there is this this element of randomness and chance. And I think that kind of what your story, but there, what I took away from it was that even if things perhaps seem bad at first, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to turn out bad. It's the thing that you perceive as bad now could potentially be the best thing that ever happens to you. Absolutely. And, you know, in scientific research, uh, serendipity plays a huge role. Okay. In the sense that true discoveries, true discoveries, almost by definition, have to be accidental because nobody is smart enough to come up with a true discovery. Okay. In fact, you know, the standard mode of scientific operation is you make an hypothesis and you test it and you're happy if the hypothesis was right and you can confirm it. And if it was wrong, maybe it leads you in a somewhat different direction. But nobody is smart enough to hypothesize the true big discoveries. Okay. So they almost have to be accidental. Uh, and any successful scientist will tell you that serendipity has graced them with discoveries at several points in their career. The classical example, the one, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, sort of learned in school was the discovery of penicillin, right? Uh, by, I guess, Fleming, where the guy's working in this lab and he has that Petri dish on the, uh, uh, on the windowsill. And one day he looks at it and there you know, he has a, what we call a lawn of bacteria that are growing all over the Petri dish. He looks at it and there are little spots where it's not, nothing is growing. And he looks at it and he sees there are in the middle of each spot, there's a colony of mold growing there. And he's smart enough to realize this is really something. He tracks it down and he discovers that the, these mold there is, is secreting something which is killing the bacteria. And that turned out to be penicillin. Uh, but yeah, that, that's an example of serendipity. Uh, but you know, they say chance favors the uh, prepared mind. Uh, and a very interesting question, uh, something I do think about a lot and talk to my trainees about is how do you maximize the chances of serendipity gracing your research? I mean, serendipity is not the province of smarter people or this people or that people. It happens to everybody. But, you know, how do you recognize it when it comes? Uh, and, uh, and how do you maximize your chances of, of receiving the gifts of serendipity? And is there, I guess, uh, a formula or perhaps a framework to, I guess, put ourselves in the position for that to happen that you've kind of thought about? What would that be? So, yes, I have, but this is specifically in the context of, I guess, the laboratory, uh, not life in general. Uh, I wish I knew how to do it in life in general, but as you say, there's a certain randomness to it. There's the same sort of randomness in the laboratory. So the fact that there must be ways of uh, enhancing the chances of being graced by serendipity is, is that if you look at the careers of scientists, I mean, there are some people who just seem to get lucky over and over and over again. And they just, hey, that can't be chance alone. I mean, it, you know, uh, so what is that? Uh, well, I think there are several things that you can do. The first thing in the laboratory is to do lots of experiments. You see, in order for serendipity to operate, you got to have data and the data has got to be showing you something strange and completely unexpected. That, that's how the serendipity presents itself. Okay. Well, if this guy loves to do experiments and he's done a hundred experiments, so he's got a hundred results and this guy has done eight. Well, I mean, there's a, more than a tenfold better chance that there's going to be some 
serendipitous thing poking out here because he's got a hundred pieces of data. So one thing I always tell people, just do a lot of experiments. If you're trying to figure out how to do something and you need to make a certain <clears throat> reagent or what we call a construct, which is a piece of DNA, you know, don't just make two or three versions, make 50. Okay. It's a lot more work, but you know, something might turn up. So that's one thing. The other thing, which is, I think, more subtle, is attitudinal. So if you're kind of expecting serendipitous things to happen, you're much likely to rec more likely to recognize them when they do. I, I, throughout my scientific career, I've had this tremendous sense every day of expectancy. So I often tell people, I go to work every day with the sense something good is going to happen today. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's going to be some serendipitous result. Maybe some new young person is going to walk into the laboratory and say, hey, Dr. Lefkowitz, I'd like to work with you. Who knows what it is? But I go in every single day with the almost expectation that something really cool is going to happen. 99% of the time, it doesn't. Okay, but it doesn't deter me. And then, but when it does, it's sort of like I've, I've been waiting for it. So, you know, somebody comes in, you know, and says, Dr. Lefkowitz, my experiment really didn't work. It really screwed up. And I said, well, what happened? Did you drop it on the floor? They said, oh, no, it went flawlessly. But look at this. The results are complete opposite of what we thought would happen. And rather than saying that's too bad, my reaction is usually, Fantastic. Let's see it. Let's go over it in detail. Because already I'm thinking to myself, this is some fabulous serendipitous thing. Now, again, what I'm telling you is most of the time it isn't. But every once in a while it is. And so I think an air or an attitude of expectancy uh, is important uh, to setting the stage for recognizing serendipitous gifts when they occur. And although what you just said there, you know, th th that is obviously very applicable to, I guess, the context of uh you know day-to-day -day life particularly in uh you know scientific applications but i mean you know straight away as you were saying there i was thinking well the people listening to this that want to start up a business you know keep experimenting you the more you experiment the more you're going to win if you're looking for a spouse keep putting yourself into positions and in terms of the i guess the seeing having the filter that something is going something good is going to happen today and um, what was kind of telling me about that was, I imagine that there are plenty of people out there that have the opposite filter, that they believe day by day something bad is going to happen. So even when something good is going to happen, they're looking for the negative in the situation, which probably sends them down a different rabbit hole. A hundred percent agree. And in fact, one of the things that uh, this came up at uh, the celebrations for me when they were talking about things that I do. When I'm interviewing young people who want to come work with me, either as graduate students or what we call postdoctoral fellows, they already have a PhD. At some point in the, during the interview, I surprise them by asking the following question. So tell me, are you lucky? Uh, and you wouldn't believe the range of answers that I get. Everything from, oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I'm i thankful. I, I'm very lucky. Uh, things seem to go my way. And, uh, you know, yeah, I guess I really am lucky. And at the other extreme, I get people who say to me, just what you just said, you know, I'm not very lucky. Things generally don't go my way. And, yeah, it's, it's too bad. So I ask you, Joseph, which ones do you think I hire? <laughs> Definitely the lucky people. The lucky ones, right. Now, are they really lucky? Of course not. They just think they're lucky. But I want people to think they're lucky. Because luck is sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think you're lucky, you're probably going to be lucky. And if you think you're unlucky, it's probably going to rain on you every day. So, yeah, I like the lucky ones. And it reminds me of that quote, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. <laughs> I like that very much. Right, right on the money. Right on the money. Yeah. 
Man, and, and I think that like one element of what we just talked about, I'd really love to pick up on. So, of course, you know, and I, I totally agree. I love the element of luck. But I guess in terms of your life, what we can't discount is the pure procedural hard work that obviously went in. Um, so I guess perhaps going back to actually quantifying it, how much work perhaps did you put in to actually you know, researching the thing that actually won you the Nobel Prize. How long was that, like, actual um, uh, series of, like, events? How long did that take? Yeah, so I would say probably, let's say my research career is 50 years. Of course, it's more if you go back to the NIH, but let's just take the 50 years of due, because I would say a good 25 to 30 years. Uh, Now, of course, not to discount the last 20. uh, We've made some great discoveries in the last 20 years. But the work that probably got me the prize uh, was really accomplished in the first 25 to 30 years. And the interesting thing is my prize, like most but not all prizes, was not recognized uh, until... uh, a good 25 years uh, after the key discoveries were made. And that's very common because I think the Nobel committees like to wait and see what is the true impact of the discovery. And that takes years, decades to really play out. Uh, So yeah, it takes a lot of work, the tremendous amount of work, but it also generally takes something else. And this is, you know, when I, talk to my fellows and, and or I give talks to trainees about keys to success as a scientist. My first, uh, second and third uh, pieces of advice are the keys to success. Most important one is focus. Actually, what I tell people is there are four keys to success. The first is focus. The second is focus. The third is focus. And fourth, you have to figure out for yourself. Uh, so the focus is such a key. And when I see scientists, not just junior scientists, but senior ones too, who I feel in their careers are falling short of what I believe their potential is, almost invariably, it's because they lack focus, they're diffuse, they work on a bunch of different things. There's magic and power in focusing like a laser on a problem uh, and bringing all your resources to bear on it. So. Wow. And I think that perhaps there's a lesson in there because I think a lot of people, and I myself have been in, you know, this, this, uh, this has happened to me where you work in a way at a problem, you work in a way at a problem and sooner or later, doubt will start to creep in and you think you know will will this eventually work will i get the payout that i'm looking for i guess you know and i suppose the lesson in there in your case is that you know success doesn't happen overnight there has to be this element of persistence did in your case did that element of doubt ever creep in did you ever think mom Maybe I would like to be a little bit diffuse. Maybe this is this new little shiny thing over by you. Maybe I could look at that. Was there there ever those elements of doubt? Of course, since I was a physician scientist, a lot of people who are physician scientists use the physician part as sort of a safety net. In other words, the idea is, hey, if the research flames out, if I never get grants, if I never make any success, you know, I'll just go back to being a doctor. I can support myself in a nice style, etc. But when I look when I look back on it, uh, the things I was trying to do, especially early on, which were the most important things, when as soon as I moved to Duke, which led to the big discoveries, uh, they were remarkably difficult. I mean, fortunately, I did not appreciate just how difficult the things were that I was trying to do. And yet, for some crazy reason, I have to be honest with you, it never really occurred to me that I would fail. 
the only question in my mind was when, how long would it take? And I was impatient, but yeah, I always felt at every stage, even though, I mean, it was kind of crazy what we were trying to do in retrospect, I would never have the courage today, but yeah, I really believed we would succeed. And I, to this day, I can't understand that. I don't know how much Yiddish, you know, Joseph, I suspect not very much. Uh, do, do you know, have you ever heard the Yiddish word chutzpah? Okay, chutzpah. It's sort of brazen gall. I mean, usually when people try to explain chutzpah, they use the example of a guy who, having just murdered both his parents, throws himself on the mercy of the court, claiming he's now an orphan. Okay, that's chutzpah, brazen gall. Uh, and I, I like to talk about the chutzpah of youth, okay? I mean, when I opened my lab, I was only 30 years old. Uh, if I was 50 or 60 at that time, I never would have even tried to do the things I was trying to do. And I, it, based on the objective evidence, I had no basis in training for even taking these things on. Uh, but, you know, chutzpah of youth, I, what the hell, you know? 30 years old, you just go for it. I love that. I love that. And how would you say that, you know, th those kind of different roles, physician, scientist, how did they satisfy kind of different, I guess, needs within you, creative or uh, practical? How did they satisfy? Absolutely. Great question, Joseph. I mean, a question I've asked myself on many occasions is, how did I get here? I mean, I, I dreamed of being nothing but a physician, okay? And during the early years of my career, you know, before I even started research, I loved clinical medicine. It was everything I dreamed of. I mean, what a privilege to be a physician. I mean, it's just amazing. And yet, in the fullness of time, I became a scientist and then wound up spending most of my time professionally doing science rather than doing clinical medicine. And I think the reason is, as you suggested, they fulfill, both are extraordinarily fulfilling careers. And the, the opportunity to do both to some extent is it's just a rare privilege. But being a physician satisfies, you know, basic human instinct, which is to help people, uh, to comfort people. And what could be more gratifying than bringing relief to a suffering human being, to ameliorating symptoms, on occasion, hopefully often, curing a disease, and frankly, saving a human life. And you get to do all of those things. I mean, what could be more gratifying? On the other hand, it's not inherently a creative enterprise. You're not figuring out new ways to do those things when you practice medicine. You're just, frankly, doing what's called standard of care. Standard of care means you do it exactly as everybody else does it. Now, and as long as you do that, nobody can get you for malpractice. I mean, the whole issue is if you did it according to standard of care, whatever it is, you're good. The opposite ethos operates in science. If you do it as any other person did it, that's called confirming somebody else's findings, no discovery, no credit, no nothing. Everything you do has to be the first time anybody ever did it. And so if you have a creative instinct, it isn't really satisfied by the practice of medicine. And of course, I didn't realize it at the time when I was making these career decisions. But yeah, I had this creative spark and it was not being fulfilled by the dream, profession I had dreamed of all those years. And so without even realizing what was happening, I found myself drawn more and more to the laboratory where I could be creative and do things that nobody else had ever done before. So... It's, it really sounds to me like, you know, medicine, there seems to be, as you said, there's like a strict guidelines, do X, do Y. 
excuse me, there seems to be like a kind of like a lot of order there in that sense. You head over into the creative pursuit, and there's this, <clears throat> excuse me, there's this kind of uncomfortable tension about having to find something. You have to be comfortable with uncertainty. And recently, I interviewed um, another Nobel laureate, uh, Gigio Parisi, who was a theoretical physicist. Um, he won the Nobel laureate a couple of years back. And he told me something, and, and it's kind of sat with me to, to, uh, ever since I spoke with him. And he was telling me about, what, uh, about one project that he had that he, that he well, it was very much on his mind. He tried to solve it at the time, but he couldn't. And he said to himself, I'm not going to close this project. I'm just going to leave it ticking over in the back of my mind. And he left it ticking over for 17 years. <laughs> just... Just just going round in the back of his mind, just thinking about it every now and then. And I thought to myself, I thought, that's a lot of kind of uncertainty, a lot of amb- ambiguity there. But what you're saying is there is that kind of element when you're trying to find something new, something groundbreaking, that you do have to kind of become comfortable with that kind of real tension, the uncertainty, the discomfort even. Absolutely correct. And it's interesting, uh, you know, a, a big part of scientific legacies, and that's something else we can talk about, legacies, uh, is mentoring. Uh, and I mentor a lot of people. I have mentored a lot of people. I just told you 250 or so and just saw many of them. Uh, but there are lots of things. So when you're mentoring somebody, it's, it's not really about telling them how to do it, what to do it. It's more about showing them, okay? Because mentoring in general is done in an apprenticeship mode. People come to work with me. Uh, They sort of live with me in the laboratory for two, three, five, eight years, and they get to watch me, okay? And that's what mentoring is all about. But a quintessential example of mentoring relates to what the story you just told me. Because over and over again, you face the problem of a project that is not making progress, not proceeding. And the question is, when that has gone on for a while and you've tried a number of approaches, do you persist, just keep banging away at it? Or do you just say, that's it, we've had it with that? Or do you just put it on hold for a while, like 17 years? It's like that country western song. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. Uh, This is true in a lot of aspects of life, both in the laboratory and in in your romantic life, too. Uh, So, but how do you know that? Well, of course, nobody does. Nobody can know that with assurance. Uh, But... Uh, some people seem to make better decisions about that than others. And in terms of mentoring, uh, I try to I try to use as much as I can as teachable moments. And so, yeah, when, when we face such a decision, I'll tell people, well, okay, I think we got to put this aside for a while, or I think we got to drop it altogether. Here's why. Uh, and, you know, I share that with them. So those are teachable moments. But, yeah, knowing when to hold them, knowing when to fold them. Sometimes a scientific problem can't be solved at a particular time because either conceptually or technically something is not yet in place, okay? Either the technique hasn't been invented yet, which would permit that problem to be solved, or conceptually, we're not ready for it. In other words, there are other concepts that would have to precede this that nobody's worked out yet. Uh, now, it's in instances often like that where serendipity will jump you over that gulf, okay? Because even without knowing the relevant things, some accident happens and you can do it. But yeah, knowing when to hold them, knowing when to fold them, very important. And in terms of mentorship, one of the things that your work led me to find out that I, I had no idea about was that for young scientists or, you know, young people who do an undergraduate, postgraduate study, simply being exposed to a Nobel laureate 
whether that's you know working for them in a as a research assistant or as a PhD student or you know in a, as we've mentioned earlier in postdoc uh, manner, there seems to be a clear link between people that have been mentored directly by Nobel laureates and them themselves going on to win Nobel prizes. And I would love to kind of ask what what is going on there? Is it the fact that they see the work ethic up front? Is it that they suddenly you know, they see someone in 3D in front of them go, this is actually possible. Why do you think that that link uh, is there? I think you're getting at it. I mean, they, in an apprenticeship mode, uh, you learn to emulate the mentor. And when I say learn, I don't even mean it so much in an intellectual way. I mean, you just you just take it on. Uh, and uh, you just take on their attributes. Very importantly, taste. Taste is so important in science uh, and, and in other professions. But the single most important type of decision a scientist ever, ever makes is, what am I going to work on? What's my problem? Uh, if you choose something that's not important or trivial, you may meet with seeming success and publish a lot of papers, but nobody will care and nobody will read them because you worked on a trivial problem. At the other extreme, you might choose a problem that's of monumental importance, but alas, neither you nor anybody else is capable of solving it right now. So the key is to pick a really important problem, but one which is reasonably within your power to solve in a real time frame. Well, how do you do that? Well, I can't explain it to you, but I can show you how I do it. If you stick around for four or five years, you'll, you'll watch we do it. Uh, and I think that's the explanation. People learn a certain sense of taste and values, uh, and, and they take them on. I know when I, I go to a lot of seminars at the university, and, and whenever I do, especially if they're out of my area, uh, I'll sit down and during the first few minutes, when I'm being introduced to the speaker is introducing his subject and which I don't know much about by definition, and I'm listening to the problem that he's setting forth. What I'm saying to myself, either that doesn't seem like something worth devoting your life to, or I'm saying, you know, this sounds like a really good problem. I'm going to really listen to what this guy has to say, but that's a matter of taste. So like looking at a painting and saying, you know, this is special. Uh, but again, nobody can truly explain that, uh, but they can show you over and over again. And that's what training in an apprenticeship mode is like. And I think with Nobel laureates who, you know, obviously represent a very uh, rarefied stratum of, uh, of scientists, uh, that's what's going on. And yeah, let's face it. Uh, I, I think that... It, it speaks to the fact that there are these transferable elements in the process of doing high quality science that can be passed from one generation to the other, not by somebody writing it down, although people are always trying to write it down. Uh, but yeah, it, it, you can't write it down, but you can show it. Uh, it's one thing to solve the right problem, but first of all, you have to decide what the right problem is. And I'm just wondering, in terms of that taste that you talked about, is that something that people develop with experience? Yes. Is that something that kind of you could work on? Is it is it some sort of framework to to know if something is the right problem to focus on from the get go? So, like just about everything else in life, some people are born with better instincts than others. No doubt about it. But everybody can raise their game. And I think one of my most important jobs as a mentor is to help people maximize their ability to make decisions like we're talking about. And I think everybody can up their game. But let's face it, some people are just intuitively better at this than others. A study published in Nature and uh, 500 Nobel laureates that were analyzed, uh, the finding was that on average, particularly in the early years, the laureates had a significant 
more number of collaborators on papers than non laureates. Uh, there was quite a number more. And I'm curious because, you know, working with people, I guess, particularly uh, at a younger stage of someone's career, that can really set the trajectory in one of two ways. I've worked in teams where they, uh, my weak spots were other people's strong spots. And in doing so, there was such a synergy there that I could have never have achieved the things in these groups that, uh, oh, sorry, by myself that I did in these teams. Conversely, I've also been parts of uh, groups in which I would have been much better doing things by myself. So what I'm trying to get at with this one is, I guess, how can we decide who the right people to work with are? Like, is there kind of things that you've thought about that you've learned? Because obviously we are a social animal. We are susceptible to those in our direct environment. Are there kind of ways to know whether someone is perhaps worth working on collaborating with? Well, I think there are several things uh, there. One, just in terms of my own experience, I tend to collaborate with people only if they can bring to the collaboration something very distinct, very distinct, which I can't, and which is complementary, that's complement with an E, complementary uh, to what I'm bringing to the table. That's, that's one point. Two, I want them to have a premier reputation uh, for integrity uh, because, uh, you know, we read a lot about fraud and science and this and that. And, you know, once you're collaborating with somebody, it generally means that some of the data that will ultimately go into a paper is going to come from outside your laboratory. And once it's outside your laboratory, you don't have quite the level of familiarity, uh, oversight, control uh, of all that. So you want somebody of, of great integrity. Uh, and then if possible, you want somebody who you really get along with and enjoy collaborating with. I have had examples of that, the opposite, where I knew going in, I don't particularly like this guy. But uh, if we're going to get this done, he's the guy. There's nobody else in the world who has this technology. So let's just do it and keep it very professional. But the ones that are real fun are when, you know, it's and most of my collaborations have been this way, where I not only respect the guy, but I like the guy. When it comes to actually generating ideas or, or hypothesis, as, as people say in science, um, were you kind of someone that has like an active process? Were you the guy writing ideas down actively, you know, very proactively seeking new thoughts, new ideas? Did you, you know, you hear about many people about these ideas would come to them in the shower or out on walks? almost kind of as a, I guess, a sub-process when they're not directly thinking about it. Where did your kind of best ideas come from? How, how did you come up with those? Well, you know, one of my uh, principles is that with my group, and I've always had a very diverse group, ranging from really junior people like undergrads. I've got 8, 10, 12 undergrads in my lab at any one time. Uh, these are college students all the way to senior professors who are here on sabbatical and everything in between. But most of them are, as I say, either graduate students or postdocs. And uh, one of my principles is, I don't care where an idea comes from. I don't care whether it comes from the senior professor or uh, you know, the sophomore undergrad. I just want the best ideas. Uh, and I encourage that. Uh, because you never know where a great idea is going to come from. Some people are threatened by having people in their group who are smarter than they are. Uh, but I'm frankly the opposite. Uh, I mean, I love having people who are smarter than me and getting their ideas. One of the greatest prods to creativity, I, for me, uh, is humor. Uh, and I use a lot of humor uh, in, in everything I do. Now, most people consider me a pretty funny guy. Uh, and at my lab meetings, I, I use a lot of humor. Uh, catches people off guard. Uh, you know, when you think about it, humor is inherently a very creative process. 
uh, in the moment I say something funny, and it, usually something funny involves the juxtaposition of things that you ordinarily wouldn't put together, uh, or changing frames of reference or double entendres. In that moment, when you see the joke and laugh, you're making a little discovery, right? I mean, an instant before the guy was drawing you in on a story, okay, and it's all serious, then all of a sudden he says something and you realize, wow, that's a surprise and you laugh, okay. That's a little discovery. That's what discovery is, putting things together that you, so I find that if I get people laughing at my group meeting, which I do routinely, uh, yeah, just ideas, creative ideas stuff flowing everywhere. Uh, and that's great. I mean, most creative ideas are frankly bullshit and, and will lead you nowhere. Uh, but if you have a hundred crazy ideas, one or two of them are probably going to be pretty good. So what you want is lots of ideas and then go through them as quickly as possible to find the one or two sort of golden eggs in there. What books would you say have impacted your life? Hmm. That's a very, very good question. When I was a youngster, uh, I was drawn to the practice of medicine by several novels that I read. One was called Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis. That was probably the main one. And again, it's been, what, I'm 80, so probably read that when I was 12. I mean, we're talking 68 years ago. The protagonist is a physician uh, who uh, actually becomes a scientist uh, and tries to find the, the uh, cause and treatment for some epidemic. That's about all I remember. But I think that book really uh, impacted my life at a very early stage. Uh, as much as any single uh, book that I that I have read. And the final question that we sign off all of our podcasts with, before I ask you to sign off and point our audience in any which way that you would like, is what makes a life worth living? Well, to me, there are only two things in life. Love and work. Uh, and if one has been reasonably successful uh, in both of those areas, uh, to me, that makes for a very fulfilling life. And if you ask what makes work uh, successful, uh, I come back, you know, I have in a 50 year career, and actually it's more like 50, 55, 58 years. But in my long career, I, I've accumulated four or five quotes that have really spoken to me, and they hang over my desk in my office. Uh, and the one that I think is relevant here is one which is attributed to late President John F. Kennedy, who at the time he said this, said he was paraphrasing Aristotle. Uh, and the quote is something like this. True happiness is the full use of your powers along lines of excellence. The full use of your powers along lines of excellence. Uh, and that's certainly been true for me. And what I try for each of my trainees is to bring them to a point where they are able to experience, most of them for the first time in their lives, what the full use of their powers is, what that feels like. And if I can do that, and I think I can most, not all, most of the time, then I think I'm setting them up for a very fulfilling career. Hugh, Hugh. Uh, yeah, man, beautifully said. And, uh, Bob, where can our audience uh, check out your work? Is there anywhere at all from social medias to books to websites, anything like that? Where, where can our audience uh, familiarize themselves with you? I think you mentioned it, but I'm going to 
go right out front here, and put it up here. A funny thing happened on the way to Stockholm. This is my uh, memoir. Uh, it's a very funny book, as you know, uh, but it's also a serious book. Uh, and if people want to know about me, how I've lived my life, uh, you know, it hasn't all been uh, roses. I mean, as you read the book, I've had health issues tragedies like anybody else. Uh, but I think this book really, uh, in between the humorous anecdotes, really uh, explains my philosophy of life and science and mentoring and all of it. So that's a great place to start. It also talks about my science, uh, although I try to put the science in, a, in, in mostly in uh, sort of chapter notes so that people who are I'm not particularly interested in the details of the science can push that to the side. This has been such a privilege for me and what a real pleasure. And uh, thank you so, so much for your contribution to the field over such a, a long and incredible career for persisting in the face of difficulties, for mentoring so many uh, brilliant minds and for everything that you've done for writing a great book and uh, for giving me the time today. So I'm really, really grateful. Thank you very much, Joseph. I've enjoyed speaking with you.